So good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for this conversation between Dr. Catherine Meeks and Dean Kate Moorhead. Uh, we're so pleased to partner with the Jack's Cathedral Bookstore for this important conversation. And all the books discussed in this workshop are available from the bookstore at jackscathedralbooks.org. And this is in the chat. Please know that we recognize that the experiences discussed in this workshop might not represent the whole breadth of experiences in all churches, but we hope you can garner insights that will spark conversation within your teams and leadership groups. Uh, we ask that you post your questions or comments in the chat feature. I'll be monitoring the chat and we'll be feeding our, our panelists uh, the questions as we get to them. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dean Kate. Thank you, Stephen. So good to see you. Uh, it's my honor to be here with Dr. Catherine Meeks, uh, who is uh, a real voice of truth and of a gospel message in our age and has recently published, well, she's published a great many books, but her most recent book is called A Quilted Life. And it is Reflections of a Sharecropper's Daughter. So Dr. Meeks, um, we are so grateful to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much. And it's my honor and pleasure to be here and, a, and to have a chance to have another conversation with you. Yeah, it's always a joy to see you. Tell us, you've written about your life before, and you've certainly written prolifically throughout your life, but why now? Why this comprehensive memoir uh, at this stage of your life? Tell us how you felt that God was calling you to write this kind of a book. Well, for one thing, I want to always make sure that people understand that I am not an exception. I am just a human like everybody else that's trying to listen carefully to what I believe I'm supposed to be doing in the in the world. People say a lot to me about, you're so courageous, you're the most courageous person I know. And I want to say, I'm not any more courageous than anybody else. I'm just trying to be a person of integrity. And so that means you, you stand with what you claim you believe. And I want people to understand that each of us has access to whatever it is they think I've had access to that's brought me to this point. I'm not trying to be a celebrity here. I'm trying to be an example of what faith, faithful pilgrimaging looks like. And mm -hmm. every one of us has the capacity to do that. And we can say yes in whatever mm -hmm. ways we can. And I wanted to show that my journey has been a rocky, turbulent journey like everybody else's. And I kept saying yes to what I believe to be the truth. And I've ended up now at 78 being this person, not because I'm way different, but because I've been trying to be faithful. And the memoir is trying to show that journey and so that people can find hope for themselves, be inspired, understand that every everything that happens to you helps you to be who you were put here to be and needs to be taken in much like the rags in the quilt uh, mm -hmm. making process. And when, in many ways, wouldn't you say that this is a journey of discernment for you? You talk a lot about feeling God's call at different times in your life and and it's very clear from the way that you write that that you you weren't clear about what the next step was at, at certain right. moments, and and but it all seems to like the quilt have come together for you. Um, That's right. Um, there's something to be thought about in saying we walk by faith and not by sight, mm -hmm. you know, because of a lot of putting the next putting your foot forward the next time depends upon trusting there'll be ground there when you do that. And the only way you can do that is because you've been standing on ground and you can trust that the ground will continue. But that is a matter of faith because you don't always see the ground in front of you until you put your foot down. And well, it's, and, you know, it, it's an up and down, in and out. We have some days way better at it than others. And I just want people to, to know that, that we're all in this together. We're all pilgrims, we're all journeying. We have our ups and downs and our good days and bad days. And if we can keep standing in the faith that God is faithful and God will be there, that we can make a, a huge difference in the world. 
And I really want to say that as much as I can. Well, and the remarkable piece about your discernment, though, Dr. Meeks, is that you became a voice for the voiceless. And, you know, getting a PhD as a Black woman of your generation is is so extraordinary. Um, so yeah. let's let's go back to the beginning, though, and Tell us about, I love the walnut grove. It, it sort of reminds me of the Garden of Eden. T tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about your childhood in the walnut grove. Well, my grandfather lived to be 101 and he was a basket maker and he and he got these little white oak trees and he would soak them and make these um, strips of wood that he then used to put bottoms in chairs and make baskets. And he was an... Um, a person who homesteaded a hundred acres of land in Arkansas, which was a phenomenal thing to do for, for him and his era. And we lived on that land. He lived there and we lived a, a, across from the house where my grandfather lived. That's where I lived for the first five years of my life. And it was like being in the Garden of Eden because I was five years old in the first <laughs> place and I didn't know anything anyway. And and except getting up and going to watch grandpa with his uh, sitting under the walnut trees, working on his baskets and then going to the house where my aunt and my grandfather lived together. And my grand my aunt had a feather bed and that was my favorite place to be. Mm -hmm. And her bed would be made up beautifully. And I would go plop myself in the middle of it. And mm -hmm. of course, the feathers would be all indenting and she didn't care. You know, Aww. so it was it was just um, it was a wonderful beginning. And I'm really glad I had it because there are many challenges along the way. Since I left that walnut grove, we moved away when I was um, just about ready to start the first grade. And so life became different from then on. Yes. And yes. it was never the same again. And, it, you know, you can't be five years old again. You can only remember what being that young was like. And it was wonderful to be in that place where everything seemed perfect. There was no, I didn't know, you don't know anything when you're five. Well, that's not quite true. You do know stuff, but the what I knew in that particular set of time was that everything was all right. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's been kind of the message all of my life, no matter what is happening, everything is all right, ultimately, because God is present. And of mm -hmm. course, I can say that now. I never could have said that when I was a little kid, but I can say that now. And as I have said in my book, all things do work together for good, even though all things are not good. Mm -hmm. So there are things that happen to you that are not good, that are painful, that cause injury, trauma, whatever, but ultimately, if you get your, if you can stay on the path that you were sent here to be on, ultimately, those things will come together to be the tapestry of your life, which is why I love the metaphor of quilt making so, so much, mm -hmm. because that makes so much sense to me, how you weave in the, the disparate pieces, the brokenness, the sorrow, the, the joy, the whatever, and it all becomes one, here I am, human being. Mm -hmm with mm -hmm. all those things as a part of my my thought processes, beginning with running back and forth to my grandfather's house and watching this old man sit there because he was an old man when I was born. Mm -hmm. And he's sitting there with all of his baskets and making mm -hmm. stuff all day. It was really wonderful. I bet that was beautiful. And they really cherished you um, as a girl. Those You had some good men in your family. Your father sounds mm -hmm. like he was very gentle and loving with you. But tell us about this brother Garland and what happened with him, yeah. because there is another another color coming into the tapestry there. Well, my brother was 12 years old and had um, was complaining of belly aches. And my father, as you do in the country, you do all kinds of remedies before you try to find a doctor. And then the remedies didn't work. And so... My father took him into El Dorado, which was about 17 miles from where we were living, and uh, to the to the hospital. And they refused to see him because we were poor and black, and that was the white only hospital. And so Daddy had to then take him to Shreveport, Louisiana, which was about 80 miles from where we lived. And we didn't have a car, 
So he had to find somebody with a car and he did. And, and then he took him to that hospital. And by the time he got there, it was too late. My brother had a ruptured appendix that ended up costing him his life at age 12. My father mm -hmm. never got over it. My father yeah. had yeah. a post-traumatic stress around that for the rest of his life. And it made him oftentimes a hard person to live with. At the time, I just, you know, you're a kid and you don't understand stuff. And now that I'm this age and a parent, I understand fully. He was just trying to protect us yeah. because he hadn't been able to protect my brother. And he he wanted to make sure that he didn't lose any more children. And I and I do understand and appreciate that. But the, the other thing about my father, that he taught me to love the land in the mornings. He would He was a sharecropper. He could not read or write. He would get up in the mornings and go walk on the acres of the cotton field where we lived later in our lives. And daddy would get up every morning and go walk that whole acreage to see what had happened to the crop in the evening mm -hmm. uh, during the night. And it just made me appreciate outdoors and, and nature in a really important way. The other really important gift that he gave to me was that he let me sit on his lap and read my books to him. Oh, and he had no idea whether I was reading correctly or not because he couldn't uh -huh. read, but he didn't care. He listened to my stories and he would listen to me read for as long as I was willing to do it. And mm -hmm. I will never, ever forget that. And I think that's been a part of how I have come to be this person who searches for knowledge mm -hmm. and uh, the other thing was my mother graduated from college when I was 18. She had gone to college all of my life. So both of my parents, though in very different ways, taught me how important it was to read and think yeah. and to have an education. And that, you know, it's amazing that a person who could not read or write gave me such a gift in terms of reading and writing. Mm -hmm. by being the they're willing to listen and be supportive in that way. Mm -hmm. So I will be grateful for um, I am grateful and I will continue to be for for that for those gifts. That's an extraordinary man who cherishes and lifts up his little girl who can do things already that he cannot was never given right. the opportunity to but what an amazing right. love to have provided mm -hmm. you with. Yeah. So they he always to took this... me, let me, let me just say one more thing. Yeah, he sure. always took me with him when he had to sign his name. Aww. He would take me with him to mm -hmm. write his name. He would make an X and then I would write his name. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was one of the, the high privileges that I had of a, that of was a gift a for my, my literacy to mm -hmm. my father. And I think that's part of why I have such a amazing passion for the voiceless yeah. Because I think we who have voices have an obligation and responsibility to speak for the voiceless and or those who don't realize, don't recognize that they have voices. But some people just don't have a voice because their their situation in life is yeah. just I haven't been given them the opportunity. That. Right. That's exactly. right. But we yeah. but we have a responsibility because we've been given the power to voice things. And so mm -hmm. I will never walk away from that uh, idea and that understanding and that sense of call. You signed on his behalf and you're signing on behalf of so many people with the voice that you've developed, Dr. Meeks. I mean, you really are. Yeah. Your writing speaks for many. That's beautiful. And then you Thank moved you. to this house with this busy street. That scared me. How old were you? I remember you talking about, you You witnessed an, a, a girl who was hit by a car. Would you tell us a little bit about what that was like for you? Yes. Well, when we left from the Walnut Grove, the Black Walnut Grove, my mother had gotten a teaching job in Moro, Arkansas, which was about 180 miles from the Walnut Grove. And we had a little three-room house that was sitting right on Highway 79. And the school, George Washington Carver Elementary School and Junior High School, sat across the street from where we lived, across the highway, it went the street, really. And of course, cars came flying through there. There were no signs, no anything to to retard speed. And so people would drive incredibly fast. It was a highway. It wasn't a it wasn't a city street. And when I was in the second, 
third grade when we lived there. I think we lived there till I was actually through fourth grade. And one morning, a little girl was hit by a car. And I, I can still see that little bump on the side of the road covered up under a coat. And that was all those years ago. And that's all I saw then. And I can just, as I'm telling this to you, I can still see her. It was so frightening and so sad. And all these years, it's still sad to me. Often that little girl pops up in my head because again, it was just a part of the negligence. No, no child should have been uh, allowed to be out there to be killed. I mean, yes. there were no street guards or anything. Yeah. And I would have to walk to school sometimes, get across the road to get to school. And it would be foggy and I couldn't see. And so I had to take a chance that I was not seeing a car and cross the road. I hated it. I was, I was scared to death and still don't like fog because of that. Because you can't tell what's what's in the fog. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you couldn't see the car till it was right up on you. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we survived that is is good. It's a good thing to be grateful that for some reason it was that little girl that died and not me. You know, mm -hmm. and I don't and this again, I'm here. I was left here for something. So let me yeah. be careful to always be looking to see what that is because that was a that was really a horrible thing that happened and, and and it begins an undercurrent that you feel in your book of 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 just fear you know this fear that mm -hmm. that that there is a a force out there of oppression and hatred that could hit you um at any time that's right and and things that you don't understand you know this too big now the world's gotten a lot bigger when right. we moved from my grandfather's mm -hmm. land and then, of course, I got older, and the older you get, the more conscious you become. And then you mm -hmm. get to picking up stuff. Just kids pick up a whole lot just in their being present, even though if nobody's even talking to them. And we didn't talk about the things that we were afraid of. I mean, that mm -hmm. Emmett Till was killed when I was a teenager, and I was really afraid for my family that where he was killed was not that far from wow. where I lived. And mm -hmm. so... And then there was school desegregation in Little Rock. And, you know, so all of those things that made it clear that things weren't right, but there was no talking about what's not right. And we were just pretty much informed that we have to keep our heads down and be careful in well, order to stay think, safe. Why do you think in your family, in your inner core family that was so loving, why do you think there was not um, an articulation of the fear I'm not even sure if they knew. Oh. I, I don't even know if they named it. I mean, I'm naming it now as this person yeah. who sees a voice. whole lot of yeah. things that they didn't see. But mm -hmm. I don't, and I don't know when sometimes when you're in the middle of things, you 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 can't afford to think about them. You just get up every day and keep right. doing what it, what it takes to survive. And mm -hmm. I think we lived in, what does it take to survive mode all of the time? Because it was always the threat of not enough money. There was the threat of crop failure. There was the threat of weather. We were poor, we were black, we were in Arkansas. So you've got all these things that can mitigate against you being okay. And yet you have to get up every day and try to be okay. Mm -hmm. And so I think that my parents spent most of their energy in survival mode and trying yeah. to make sure we had what we need. My mother was going to school. My father was working as a janitor at the school and also sharecropping. We worked hard and life was hard. And yeah. so it, you, you don't talk about it. You just live it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a way to articulate it would be to just give it more of your time and attention. You're just trying to, just trying to stay the course and move through the difficulties. Yeah, that's right. Well, tell me a little bit about, so you you greatly valued education, obviously, from your parents, um, but how did you have the perseverance to to keep going, to, to get to college and then beyond? How did that, how did that interior perseverance happen for you? Well, I think when I graduated from high school in Arkansas, in Brinkley, Arkansas, I just knew I needed to leave Arkansas. 
And and the only thing that made any sense was to talk about college because you, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? My yeah. older sisters and brothers, I had my father had been married before and his first wife had died. And so I had older sisters and brothers and they lived in California. And so I went to California to go to college, which was such an amazing shock to my system mm -hmm. because I'd never even been in a big city before. Wow. I mean, I'd never even been like to, well, I'd been to Little Rock and Pine Bluff and those were the biggest, and Memphis, those were the biggest cities I'd ever been to. So Los Angeles was culture shock and Another all kinds of yeah. things. And first year student in college is, that's hard too. So mm -hmm. I don't, I lived with my older brother for the first year, which was a little hard to adjust to, even though everybody was always helpful. No, Nobody in my family was ever trying to keep me from doing things. I think they sometimes didn't understand what I was doing, but they but they were always in, in enough to be supportive. So it was a rocky year, but I did okay. I I didn't know that I was smart enough to to do as well as I did. I I was worried all the time, and I had a couple of teachers that were able to see past my own sense of insecurity and see me for who I was, and that was really good. One was mm -hmm. a world literature teacher that really just helped me to fall in love with uh, with Russian literature and other other people, other places I'd never heard of. The other mm -hmm. person that was incredibly significant was my philosophy teacher, uh, and Dr. George. I will never for forget her. She taught me to love the the life of the mind, with mm -hmm. the with my philosophy classes, and I actually took a whole year of philosophy, even though I only had to take one semester because of her, because mm -hmm. she she was just such a, a inspiration to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm really grateful for, you know, this is God's um, doing. I think to to orchestrate all of this, but to 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 put these people on my path to help me, this little girl from Arkansas. Yeah. who didn't know anything, comes to college in California with a second, third rate education because it, it, our education in Arkansas was way less than what it needed to be. I didn't have foreign language. I had foreign language for a year, but never really got very uh, fluent in it. I didn't have, we didn't have good uh, lab uh, facilities. We just, we didn't have libraries. You know, we just didn't have, so many things in our high school. So to for, to graduate and be in California in college with people that had gone to school in Los Angeles with one of the oh, states that yeah. had the best education system in the country and to end up surviving it was a good thing. Just Amazing. surviving it, you know. Yeah. So. You know, it brings to mind from that first chapter and the first verses of the Gospel of John in the beginning was the word you kind of discovered mm -hmm. the word, didn't you? Yes. Do you, feel, and, do you feel God's presence when you're reading great literature and, and learning new ideas, Dr. Meeks? Well, I think I think I have this. It is very interesting, the, the connections, the sense of connection and enthusiasm. And um, and I'm also just amazed at how how much alike human beings are across the whole world and good literature helps you to see that and good art helps you too with that too but um I I live in a in a kind of a funny space I used to when I was younger to, to worry about trying to see what what is it to be in the presence of God and now I just realize I'm always in the presence of God and I just need to be uh you know engaging in different ways that that manifests itself it's like friendship you know you have friends and you they're part of you whether you are with them or not with them they're part of you and so I've rested and relaxed into that a whole lot more I do things like I, I feel very uh peaceful and centered when I'm ironing or when mm -hmm. I'm doing mundane tasks or when I'm doing uh making greeting cards I love making greeting cards and playing with aroma uh, uh, essential oils to make mm -hmm. different kinds of aromatherapy uh, concoctions. And all of those things are inspiring and help me 
to stay centered, stay focused, and stay hopeful. Yeah, oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. You realized over time God was speaking to you all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and your yeah. studies eventually took you to Africa. Tell me about how that unfolded for you. Mm. What what hunger was it inside of you that took you all the way to Gambia? Yeah, it was a bit of it was a pretty long journey from uh from the Walnut Grove through my graduate work at uh in social work and my work with death and dying at Grady Hospital, which is the public hospital here in Georgia. All of those things happened before I decided that I should go get a PhD. And so then I enrolled in school at Emory and they had a particular program that was, that was an interdisciplinary that I was interested in where I could study African and African-American issues alongside Jungian psychology. So that's what I was doing. And I was wow. in that graduate program at Emory and my major professor was an Africanist and I was delighted to meet her. And she encouraged me to, to, to think of visiting somewhere in West Africa. Mm -hmm. And I had thought, well, yeah, I would like to do that, but it it's, it seemed too big for me at the time because I was working full time and going to school. And it turned out that there was this program called Operation Crossroads Africa that takes folks like myself and places us as leaders of small groups of young people that they send on work projects to mm -hmm. varying countries in Africa and the Caribbean. And I got, I, I applied for that program and was accepted as a leader and took a group of college students for six weeks to Gambia. And then after going there, it was, I was just, I had to go back. And so I went back and I ended up meeting the person I ended up marrying yeah. from, well, as a part of that, going back and forth to Gambia. But it was, um, it was an amazing thing to put my feet on the African soil. I had no idea that it would be so powerful for me when I was trying to get there. And then once I got there, I realized I really did have to go back and I did have to start being more conscious about how I'm connected and where I'm connected. I have no idea which part of Africa my people came from. And that doesn't really particularly concern me. I know that my people came from there and I know there are a lot of things that I still have to learn about that whole place. And I'm in the process of working on a lot of that now. And it's very exciting to me. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah, I think we're all looking for God and we're all looking for ourselves, aren't we? And um, yes. I heard that it's, I love the term that people have started using that you're an American of African descent. I'm an American right. of English descent. I like that mm -hmm. so much better. We're always looking for the right terms, but we we need to to go to our roots sometimes and see where we came from, uh, our ancestors. I think that's exactly right. I think we need to be very careful to honor the particulars of ourselves, where we came from, our ancestry, the, the stories, the the ways in which we were raised. All of those things are so critical. And the, and if we, if we get a good, a better sense about all that, I think we can be less afraid of each other. Yeah. Because yeah. then when I meet you or I meet somebody I don't know, I don't have to think that I'm going to lose something by engaging with somebody that I need, that I don't know much about. You know, mm -hmm. the fear that we have of one another is actually killing us mm -hmm. and we have got to get over it. And I think the remedy is to get more connected to who you really are and to feel grounded in that to the point that you're not going to be blown away by every wind as Howard Thurman says will happen to you if you don't get grounded and yeah. who you are. So my my whole, that's right. My whole journey has been about what's the root system? What, where did, where, where am I grounded? Where did I come from? What am I doing here? What's the point of it all? Mm -hmm. And when you have those kinds of conversations with yourself and that becomes kind of the foundation of your journey, you end up feeling confident when you meet a stranger because you, you know where you stand and yeah. now you can find out who is this person and mm -hmm. where do they stand? And then, and then I think we can become 
more universalist. We can be ready to engage everybody on the grounds of being human because our particularities are really clear to us and we're not in some kind of confusion. Yes. So I think when yeah. people don't know who they are, they're just scared to death of everything. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's us as a as a country, as a culture, yes. as a as a world in, in many ways. We we so I'm 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 really preoccupied with get this self-truth straight so that you can be free to be to connect to other people on the planet so we can save the planet because we're not doing very well in that process at the moment. I sure do agree with you. Thank you for that. That's pearls of wisdom. And tell us about the Jungian part. So you're learning yeah. about yourself. Explain to us, um, maybe many of us, I've read some Carl Jung, but explain to yeah. us a, a little bit about that philosophy and how that part of it was so important mm -hmm. as well. Well, in the first place, Jung is incredibly hard to understand because he assumes that people know everything he knows and he writes from that perspective. So I've <laughs> spent a lot of years studying him and I still have I'm just feeling like I'm scratching the surface. He is intimidating, but the, yeah. The idea of the collective unconscious really makes sense to me, that we're all a part of each other. And the whole business about the shadow, the side of ourselves that are hidden, you know, those particular points have been so enlivening for me and helped me to deal with, like, the stuff I don't like about myself, the things yeah. I do, rather than to assign them to somebody else to help me, Jung helps me to understand I've got to engage with that and I've got to work on it and I've got to get it straight with myself. I can't give it away. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't put it, which is projection. You know, I'm going to assign it to you rather than it's mine and let me see what I need to do with it. And that is just, um, that I think that's a priceless concept. That, that whole business of owning your own stuff that you don't like mm -hmm. about yourself instead mm -hmm. of trying to put it off on other people. And, and you know, he talks about it in such, uh, it, would take you, it took me years to really get what he was talking about, but the practice of being more conscious and owning yourself and standing with yourself and accepting yourself, all of that, the, the Jungian, a uh, way of looking at reality helped me to come to grips with for myself. Mm -hmm. And it's been a, a wonderful thing. And it's that has informed all of my work and all of the ways in which I think and write. And sometimes I think Jung's probably turning over in his grave because I make it too simple. But I, I don't think it's as complicated as, as he has mm -hmm. made it because I think people can understand this concept of you need to accept yourself and be yourself without having to study him for 40 years. But it's very think, helpful. Do you think that the, the Christian notion of sin is related to that a little bit? The understanding that we all have uh, parts of ourselves that are a bit bent or broken that we need to forgive and, and understand. Mm. Do you think there's some relevance well, to that? I think that... The, um, I think there are, I think we've gone a little overboard in the Christian world with how bad we are. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think we're as bad as we, as we want to make ourselves, as we sound like about some things and we're worse about other things probably, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. God made us and God loves us. And so I prefer to start there and they're, they're broken pieces. And yes, those are separations. I'm separated from myself and God in terms of wherever those broken places are. And I can, because God loves me and is really on my side as I am on the side of my children and want the best for them, I can explore those broken places and find healing. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about healing all the time in the Christian community. We just don't talk about how is it supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. It's almost like it's supposed to be magic. It's not. You know, there is no magic. I mean, there is healing. We just got through celebrating Easter. And so we better be believing something yeah. here. Yeah. But I think that the healing is a process. I mean, yes, Jesus did raise people from the dead and heal people on the spot. 
And I, so I think that can happen, but it's not the general rule. The general rule is that it takes work. It takes being willing to be in a process. It takes waking up, waking up to what needs to be changed and then seeking the, the strength and power and courage to do it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that whole uh, business of sin mm -hmm. and forgiveness and all of that is wrapped up in, we need to let people know that it is a process and you need help. You need counseling. You need spiritual And you need directors. to look at the wound before you can heal it. You have to acknowledge that's exactly the right before you can heal it. Right. Right. And that's right. So just sitting, sitting somewhere and having people tell you, you, you know, all these glorious things we say on Sunday morning, not that helpful to people. I mean, mm -hmm. people need to hear that here, here's this, these issues here, and here's some ways you can begin to explore this and work on it and name it. And that it's all right to do all of that. You don't have to be kicking yourself in the head because you're not a saint. I mean, really, you're a person. And and you and we've got good stuff and not good stuff, right? And we need right. to be trying to see how what do we want to do about all of that, you know? Because what I think you need to do about it, you're not going to do anyway. You got to sit down and think, what do I want to do about it? How do I want to be in the world? And yes. so I I just I just wish that we could have communities that were more um, kind in this whole arena, and 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 allowing people to come with their brokenness and be accepted. I believe the reason why the suicide rate is climbing and things are not so good for us in this country is because we have this too much judgment, too much harshness, too much, you need to be somebody you're not. You can only be who you are. Mm -hmm. And We're you can look at that and say- trying to put a face on ourselves that's not the truth, our selfie That's face. right. Yeah. Yeah, and you can yeah. say, this is who I am, and it's not who I want to be. How can I do something about that? Where are the remedies? I mean, that was always me. I don't want to be scared. I don't want to be discontent. I want to be peaceful. I want to be courageous. How? Where Where are the, 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 the solutions to this fear mm -hmm. or, or to my feeling discontent or not liking myself? Or th That's why I wrote this book, to try to say, mm -hmm. You can own all of those things and and God will meet you. God will meet you in that place with somebody, you know, in your dreams, in your just interactions with people, healing will come. You know, Howard Thurman says, uh, you might pray, pray particular petitions to God and you may never see those particular petitions answered, but God will always answer you. Mm -hmm. You will not be ignored. So if mm -hmm. you know if, I, if I'm asking for somebody up the road to get a a job and they never get the job, it doesn't. That's not the point. God will answer me, though mm -hmm. I may not have gotten what I was asking for. And the the idea that I won't be ignored by the God of the universe is so powerful. So powerful. And to just look for where the answer comes. I mean, it, so I'm over here looking and I don't see the answer, but maybe it's come from some other directions that I didn't, that I wasn't paying attention to. So that's consciousness developing when you start learning to pay attention to everything. I don't, I pay attention. If I see a butterfly on the tree outside, I listen to see, I look to see, what are you trying to tell me today? <laughs> you know? of uh, the hummingbirds. I mean, there are answers everywhere and yeah. we have to just learn how to pay more attention to them yeah, and discernment. honor them. The, the discernment is about seeing, isn't it? Discernment is about That's opening right. your eyes to what's right in front of you, right? Tell us a little bit about how you, you're you so wonderful about this notion of the shadow self and healing, but you yourself has, have also grappled with chronic pain for, a, for many, oh, yeah. many years. Explain to yeah. us how how you've managed to do to live with that and to be so hopeful and and mm. and. Well, positive. I have had rheumatoid arthritis now for close to forty years, and it is worrisome and painful. It's taught me a lot of lessons about taking care of myself, being patient, of being patient with other people, of uh, learning that that. I can be all right. I can do things in spite of. 
all of those things. I, I say that arthritis has been one of my greatest teachers. Mm -hmm. Now, would I have preferred a different teacher? Perhaps. I don't know who the other teacher would be, yes. but you know, I don't want to, I want to be careful about that because it could have been a worse teacher actually. Mm -hmm. yep. But um, mm -hmm. I wish, I know I don't wish I've ha have had to suffer with arthritis, but I have. And so my attitude about it is, it's inconvenient. It's hard. It makes me have to reevaluate and do things in a different way than I would have if I didn't have it. But I'm very it's not the definition of me. You know, arthritis is something that is a part of me, but all of these other parts are just as real and just as true. And even though arthritis has caused me sleepless nights and and worry, it's still not all of who I am. And I won't let it take my identity away. You know, for some people, their illness becomes them. Yes. And they're nothing else but the illness now. But that's not true. You're, you're not just your illness, no matter what illness you've got, you still are a person. Yeah. And the illness is a part of you. And how so so for me it was, what is this all what does all this have to do with anything? Why is this happening? What am I supposed to learn? How do I need to respond to this part of myself? Mm -hmm. And I've I've changed my life. I'm not the same person at all that I that would have that I would have been if I hadn't had arthritis. I don't think mm -hmm. I, I've learned I've learned so much. And and whenever when I preached at the Washington National Cathedral, I talked about having arthritis and I thought maybe you could have come up with a better subject. But actually <laughs> it was it was perfect because so many people responded to that part of the sermon and people that were in wheelchairs, people that mm -hmm were suffering from chronic things. The 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 hope, the the uh way I had talked about uh dealing with it rather than cursing it and pushing it away, right. saying you're here and you are a part of me and I have to see what you are looking for. Mm -hmm. What is what is arthritis asking of me? And you know, they told me about 25 years ago that by now I would be in a wheelchair and not probably able to get around. And I'm, you know, I'm still getting around That's and right. I hope to keep doing that. I don't intend to have a wheelchair uh, mm -hmm. to be, I take wheelchair service at the airport, but I don't intend to have to live with a wheelchair if I can help it. But if that happens, it happens. I, I'm just, I just think every day has to be taken on its own and yes. you have to deal with what is that day and what is that day about and what do you need to learn and what do you need to give and what do you need to let go of? I mean, those are, that takes up a whole lot of energy. And if you get done with that, you don't have much for other stuff. So, yeah. you, you know, kind of let it, just let it go. So mm -hmm. anyway. Good for you. Wow. You know, one of the most beautiful moments, there are so many beautiful moments in your book, but this quilt of remembrance that you did um, with people mm -hmm. that had lost children to violence. Would you talk a little bit about that experience? It bears on the title of the book as well. Yes. Well, um, I had a very wonderful experience of being asked by the mayor of Macon, Georgia, to, to at the university was asked to let me be a loan executive in his office for, it started out to be a year, but ended up to be two years. And he said he needed somebody to run the uh, youth prevention, uh, violence prevention team, and could I come and do that? And so I, I, the, my president said yes, and I went. And I ended up working with about 40 women whose children had been murdered, who were victims mm -hmm. of homicide. It was a horrible moment, but it was also a good moment. It was the, the grief in the room was always just, all you could just about feel it all the yeah. time, just almost pulsating in the room. And those women, though, it was mostly women, even though there were men who's, who had lost children, they didn't choose to be a part of this ongoing gathering. So we decided that they needed to do some a project together, and they wanted to make this quilt of remembrance. And so everybody was invited to bring 
things to remember the person that had been murdered and create this big quilt. And one day, one of the women whose whole family had been murdered, she came home from work and her husband and her two children were dead oh, and God. they had been tortured yeah. and killed by some deranged guys uh, that said she thinks that we think that they spent the day torturing them and then killed them. So I don't really know how this lady was able to get out of bed every day, but right. she did somehow manage. Mm -hmm. And one day she came and she just couldn't take it anymore. And she was working on her quilt piece and she just got up and threw it all in the trash and just was just like, I've had it. I can't do it. It's beyond me. And everybody just let her say all of that. And she left the room. And one of the ladies went and took all of her stuff out of the trash and smoothed it all out and laid it on a table and a shelf in good order because we knew she would come back. And that was the hope and the prayer. And a few sessions later, she came back and there her stuff was waiting for her. Mm -hmm. And that is what I think the community needs to be, where you yeah. can fall apart and do what you need to do. And people will say, that's okay. We will keep the space. We will hold the space for you. And that work, that two years of working with that youth violence prevention team was amazing to me. I bought guns back from kids. We had bought gun buybacks. Um, wow. It, it's wow. interesting to see that people are doing that again now. I, yeah. I was surprised. But I did that 20 years ago. Uh, we got somebody to give us money and we, we'd we have Saturday gun buybacks and we got a lot of guns off the street. Mm -hmm. And people would say, well, they'll get another one. And that's, maybe they will, but this one won't kill anybody because yeah. yeah. we have it. And the police department helped us with that and, and uh, destroyed the guns after they were collected. So the work was hard work. And I spent, I cried a lot. It was sad work but it was really good work. And we made this beautiful quilt that was hung at City Hall for a good while. And then it was taken to the convention center. But unfortunately, somebody finally took it down. They said it made them too sad. No. Wow. So I think that's unfortunate. And I think that just says a lot about um, how, how we how we are in this country with wanting to run from things. Yeah, that's true. That's unfortunate. Well, yes. you you have gotten uh, later on more and more to become an advocate. You've become a voice of advocacy and justice and racial reconciliation. Uh, tell us more about how that began to unfold. Um, certainly, it it really was unfolding your entire life, but you you really have taken on now such a public role. Well, it it's again a step by step. You know, when like I set out 20 years ago to be here. I set out 20 years ago to stay alive and learn what I could learn and be what I could be. And and it ended up here. And I just see, I see what I see and I think I see it clearly that if we wanna save ourselves and save the planet, we've gotta learn how to live together better. Yeah. And race is one of those places where we just use it as a weapon to keep us separate because it's mm -hmm. it's it's an illusion you know if you if we if both of us didn't have skin we would be bloody people we would be saying yeah, we both exactly be a bloody alike. mess <laughs> yeah right so given that fact then let's we need to get we so yeah i see you and i know you're a white woman you see me you know i'm an african american woman but those are facts that cannot be use to keep us from understanding we're human beings mm -hmm. and we have many things in common beyond the color of our skin or the narratives that we grew up on. And so I just have felt compelled to bring that message everywhere I can as much as I can. And it's been re it's been really well received all yes. across this country. Yeah. And I'm deeply grateful for that. I, I had no idea where this all would go. It was just like, you do one thing and then you do the next thing and you do the next thing. And and then you watch God weave it together and make whatever God chooses out of it. And I'm and that's where I continue to be. 
I'm, I now have, I have left the Center for Racial Healing. I am now uh, running my Turquoise and Lavender Institute for uh, Transformation and Healing. And I believe that we it's all about quilt making. And mm -hmm. I'm going to keep on putting out those, the best quilt pieces I can find mm -hmm. and inviting other people to find theirs. And, and, and let's see how we can continue to weave uh, a pathway to healing that has race that's that race and class and gender and 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 physical ability and all of that stuff uh, honored and respected but but we understand that the bigger project is that we're human yeah. and and we need to just figure out how to be a little bit better at that right and you moved from doing anti-racism training to beloved community Tell us about the difference, why you chose to change those words. Well, I actually went from anti-racism to racial healing and beloved community is kind of on the way there. But because I felt like, for, for one thing, anti, if you say you're against something, that doesn't feel very inviting. I mean, so, yeah, okay. That's true. <laughs> you know, it, it's much, it's it, people, I think people respond better to being invited into healing than to mm -hmm. be invited into something to be against, number mm -hmm. one. And number two, I felt like I feel like that healing is what we've got to work on in order to build beloved community, in order to build uh communities of 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 uh, support and that communities that are able to demonstrate God's love because of the way we love each other. I mean mm -hmm. that is what the scripture says. They will know you belong to me because of the way you love each other. Well, we don't have much proof of that any at the moment. Right. We 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 need to work really harder to to have to show the world that we belong to God by the way we love each other and love others is about healing. And you can mm -hmm. do that when you are more of a well person yourself. So it just keeps going around in that circle mm -hmm. all the way back to developing consciousness and, and healing yourself so that you can actually be a, a witness to the to to life can be different from the divisive violent way we seem to uh, have imagined it to be. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Dr. Meeks, we only have eight minutes left and I want to cherish those eight minutes. We do have a question in the chat. Um, have you read The Cross and the Lynching Tree? And if so, oh, any goodness. thoughts? Of course, I've read that. I've taught that have. book. Yeah. Even <laughs> I've read that. <laughs> <laughs> I've read that book and I've taught that. I've taught that book and it's an amazing book and people need to read it and understand what uh, Professor Cohn is talking about. I think uh, I love James Cohn. I love his passion and he's dead now, but I love his passion and his courage and and whoever is asking that question, I hope you've read the book and I hope you share it with a lot of people. It's a, it's a marvelous, um, it's marvelous. I, I also would want to encourage people to read Howard Thurman, the Jesus and the Disinherited. Uh, his, his biography is helpful. Uh, just to, I think, immerse, becoming immersed in uh, understanding the necessity to appreciate the history but not to be uh, immobilized by it. Mm -hmm. I think that's, we we have to keep on delving into our history and owning it, but we can't let it immobilize us. It needs to become, again, part of the quilt that moves us on to wherever it is where God wants us to go. And, and that lynching tree is a cross, but a Jesus moves through it and into the resurrection. And in a way, uh, Dr. Meeks, when you talk about the struggles of your life, you're lifting up your cross so we can follow and learn. And and that's exactly right. what Jesus is asking of us is don't be ashamed or run away from your pain. Uh, move through it and lift it up and, and learn to use that's it to right. love the world, which is what you're doing. Right. Well, and so what, you know, the you thing, doing? all of us are in the same boat. I mean, none of us yeah. is all, any better off than anybody else. We're all here. We're all wounded. And God is offering us a chance to be well. And we have to say whether we want that or not. So the big question I ask myself over and over 
the same question I ask everybody else is, do you want to be well? Mm, you know, beautiful. do you want to be well? Because if you do, yes, in spite of arthritis, in spite of cancer, in spite of whatever, do you want to be well? And then, then okay, then if the answer is yes, how do you get there? And what does that look like? And it doesn't look like what we think it looks like. It looks like whatever God tells us it looks like. And we have to listen for that because I'm well, even though I have arthritis and it's hard for me to get around. I, I am well, and I'm you glad well. to be able, to, be able to say yes. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. And Dr. Meeksa, so tell us a little bit about, um, oh, here's another question that came in. I'll pause mine. How to how do you talk to young people who have been turned off by religion because of Christian nationalism? Good question. Yeah. Well, I think you start with helping them to understand that we've made up a whole lot of stuff that doesn't have anything to do with God. Mm -hmm. And we need to try to get find some ways to find out what who who God is and what is God really trying to tell us. And we have allowed religion itself to stand in the way of that quest. And so I think we have to search for the truth. And, and the, the Jesus said that if you find the truth, it'll set you free. And so that for me means that you've got to be willing to look for it. And so I tr try to encourage young people and anybody not to get immobilized by injury, but to look for healing. So if you if people have told, I mean, there's a lot of foolishness going on around religion and it has always been a lot of foolishness and how do you find the relationship and path to God in the midst of it and those of us that are older have to be patient with the young folks who are fed up and help them to see a clearer path I mean we we want them to be someplace that they can't be and and sometimes we want them to be in some place we're not even in our own selves you know, so I'm willing to hold their hands while they rant and rave and want to throw it all away. I get how they feel about it, but then they have to find their own way and they have to do something besides rant and rave and they have to do something besides be immobilized. Those are those may be some of the pieces on the way, but some you got to be on the way to consciousness and do, and and doing something. Otherwise, you just get to be a part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Meeks. I, would it be too much to ask for you to say a quick prayer for all of us who are watching you and trying to find out who, who we are and who God is calling us to be in this crazy world? Well, of course not. I, I, I so want that for everybody. I believe everybody, because everybody is a beloved child of God, God's purpose for all of us is that we should be well. And so I want to pray that everybody will have the courage to ask that question of themselves. Do I want to be well? And the and the courage to listen for a real answer and not just some answer that's been made up of, of that's always been there. Or, you know, can we really ask that question and listen for the answer. So my, mm -hmm. my prayer is that all of the folks who have joined us today will be a half a shade braver in this quest for, for wellness. Mm -hmm. Amen and amen. God bless you, Dr. Meeks. And thank yeah. you so much for being with us today. It's so good to be with you again and take good care of yourself. You too. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.